I'm Alex. Um, I work as an independent uh, consultant. Uh, I try to Twitter and blog and uh, part of the Smart for Apex group. Some of other speakers already talked about that. Um, I wrote a book on uh, Apex best practices. And if you were at the last keynote yesterday, this is my gorilla stick. I'm one of the uh, Oracle ACE directors for database development. Um, and I said I would never write a book again on anything, but I got trapped into writing some chapters on a different book. It's not out yet, but it will be soon. So this calendar year, they say, yeah. Um, so what am I going to do these 45 minutes? I'm going to make some confessions. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. You may have gathered that. Um, I had German in school, but I'm really lousy at it. Uh, I do understand it, somewhat. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of German um, while we're doing this talk, okay? I'm going to tell you my way of structuring Apex applications. And it's not specific for Apex applications. It could be basically any database applications. And i really like to hear your thoughts as well, okay? Um, I don't mind having questions or comments uh, while we're doing these 45 minutes. So please feel free to jump in, join in the discussion, okay? Uh, if you take too much of my time, I will cut you off. But we have still have 45 minutes to go, so we're good, right? So I'm not going to be talking about HTML or CSS or JavaScript or anything like that, okay? My main focus is in the database. I'm a database developer. So I'm going to tell you about my first time. Well, my first time with Apex, okay? Um, I think it was 2005 at an ODTuck conference, and someone was talking about Apex at that time. It was called, still called HTMLDB, okay? And it sounded interesting. Um, he showed some demos and was really nice. I can't remember who, who the speaker was, but he said, with HTMLDB, so Apex, you can create applications so fast you won't give the end user time to change their mind. <laughs> and that got me hooked. I'm like, wow, that's awesome, right? You can whip out these applications, and before they say, wow, what I really meant was, bah, it's there already, right? So I thought that was really good. And I, like I said, I can't remember who said it. Um, so if you have a clue, I'll update it. Okay. At that time, I was still heavily in forms and reports, exactly. So that was my little thing that I did, forms, reports. Um, forms is still alive, right? This is a new logo. I couldn't find a new logo for reports. So it's, forms is still alive. It's not dead. It just smells funny. But <laughs> anyway, I was creating all these, these kind of applications. Anyone? Form developers or former form developers in the room? Yeah? Good. Okay, so you kind of know what I'm talking about, right? These hideous green screens, and uh, you, you can also flip them to blue, like a real dark blue. Um, and I would always spend lots of time on these forms and trying to line them up and get them correctly. And if you would line up something different, then you had to line up the prompts and get all these blocks and blah, blah, blah. I had to do it. I'm not a... At that point, when I was doing all these forms development, I really decided I really want to do SQL and PL SQL because this is not my thing. Okay. Um, while I was preparing these slides, I noticed that, like, like the menu, the top menu you had in forms, it had an actual action button in there. So these interactive reports with an action button, it's not that new. Okay. So with this HTML DB, it came with all these templates. So I was like, wow, that's cool. All these templates, all these really beautiful, and this a later screenshot, of course. Um, so I didn't have to think too much about all this UI stuff, okay? Um, and then, he, then that presenter said, oh, it's free, free of charge. Well, and it runs everywhere, right? Because it runs, well, if you have an Oracle database. And at that time, it was Oracle 9, or maybe 10, if you're really cutting edge. So I was really excited about all this stuff he was telling me about this HTML DB. 
Um, so I really wanted to get my hands onto it, start building my applications so fast, right? Um, and one of the things you, you the, the, with HTMLDB or Apex at the uh, time, um, this is from the apex.oracle.com, and it says everywhere, like, to develop it, it's easy to do it. To customize it, it's easy. To deliver your, it's easy. Right? And we all know this. It's easy to do everything. It's also easy to create a mess. And that's what I did. So I really wanted to get started with this Apex or this HTMLV. I just dove in and created like a big mess. I was in a talk this morning, um, and they were showing an application. And they had most of the SQL, PL SQL, in the application itself instead of in the database. So I think there was one or two procedural functions in the database, and the rest was all in the application. And that's kind of like a pitfall, if you, at least for me it was, that you, um, you want to start working with it so fast you forget about the rest. And that's what I did. So I created a messy application, and it was horrible. It was really awful. Um, and while I'm in this confession mode, okay, so I do create crap, basically. And while I'm confessing, you know Shakib. Yeah, he's, a, he's at the conference. He's going to do a talk after this one, I think. Uh, Shakib, he's, a, he's the one who came up with, or I'd like to think that he came up with the universal theme. So like I said, I don't do UIs very well, so I'm very happy with this universal theme. And he came up with it. I love this guy. <laughs> I really, I think he's, he's wonderful, so I don't have to think. I can concentrate on my SQL, appeal SQL. Ah, oh, Shakib, I love you. So now I don't have to think about my UI anymore. So after I created my first messy application, I really said, well, it's, it is easy, it is fast, and I hated it. I hated Apex or HTML DB at the time because they kind of tricked me into writing all this stuff in the application instead of doing it the proper way. So I thought about it a little bit longer. I said, well, I didn't, don't hate, really hate Apex, but I hate the Apex developer. So I hate you guys. And it's like, well, that's not fair, is it? Because I'm the one who created that messy application, so I basically hated myself for creating this mess. That's the way it is. And I know I'm not alone at creating crappy, messy applications. You don't all have to come forward and say, well, uh, <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. So, um, we all heard about this apex.world, uh, apex right? Um, we heard a little about it during the conference. And there's also a section for beginners, how to start as a developer. Okay, so if you go there, there's a little thing, oh, let's wreck this together, like the hashtag, becoming a professional Apex developer. And they have like a little banner there. And it says, you are 30% if you start with Oracle Apex for tutorials and books and whatnot. Okay, 60% the Oracle database. Learn the basic principles of the Oracle database, SQL and PL SQL. This is what I hate. Learn the basic things about SQL, database, PL SQL, because we know it's going to be messy if they only know the basics, right? And there's a whole new generation coming of these developers um, that are going to be like, oh, it's easy, it's basic, you can do stuff with it, ship it to production. And in case you're wondering who this is, that's Mark Hurt, that's the CEO of Oracle. I thought that was funny, but okay. <laughs> yeah, now the other one, that's my son, so that's cool. So I hate it if it's easy. Well, I don't hate it if it's easy, but if it kind of tricks you into doing, creating crap, all right? Or if it's, say, basic, or one of the other things that really grinds my gears, it's, it's, it's generic. <laughs> I don't like that kind of stuff. Okay, so what am I talking about, actually? Okay, you know the, the sample application, yeah? So this should be, okay. If you look at the query that's under this customer's um, uh, uh, page, well, you see a query directly on the table, and it does some concatenation of the name, last name, first name, and it does something with the address as well. 
So if you need to change this, you need to actually go in, change things around. Right? Now you get a new requirement for this customer's table. I don't know how it works at your shop, right? Because there are shops that actually give you like, oh, this is the documentation for the new requirement and, and so on and so on. At our shop, they just get you like a sticky note and they put it on your desktop and say, oh, we need customer rating, do it. Right? So that's the whole FO, TO, design, everything. So that's easy enough if you do a database, right? So you change the customer's table, add a new column to it, put some comments in there as well, so you know what, you're, what it's actually supposed to do. If you update everything and we make it mandatory. Easy enough. So the new requirement implemented really fast. If you go back to your page, it all works fine. Right? Nothing going on there. You edit one of the customers in there, that's fine. Now when you want to create a new customer, and you put in all the details and you hit save, then you get like the insert into, insert into null exception. Right? Because we added a mandatory column to the table, and we, Apex needs to know about that as well. Okay, so this is where your application basically breaks. But it's not really obvious at the moment you start changing your table structure. Okay, this one's easy, right? Because you change the customer's table, you know that because we added a mandatory column to it, we also need to uh, do some extra work for that. With which of the other pages do you also need to change? Which of the other pages is affected as well? That gets tricky. You can search for it. There's a search capability in Apex. And then you get like this. First of all, you have to wait, depending on how big your application is. And then you get your whole list of things. And you have to go through each of them. Each, each of them. Uh, and then you discover more of this concatenated stuff in there. OK? Um, and then you get finally get to your page. And you're like, OK. So where is it? It could be there, there, here, there, everywhere, basically. <laughs> right? And there are so many places where you can put SQL and peel SQL, drop it in, and here, there, and everywhere. Okay? Um, and then you discover, well, hang on, this search thing also has a current page only. Well, that narrows it down a bit more, but only after you hit the search for the first time. Anyway, it's like, where's Waldo in your application? You know the... For especially for kids, where's Waldo? Okay, it's a. This guy is called Waldo. Okay, he might be called different in German, so I don't know. Um, that's Waldo, a little guy wearing a red and white sweater, and you have to search for him in like a picture like this one. Okay, so where's Waldo? And that's what you're doing in your application, in your page yourself, right? Oh, I made a reference to this demo customers table, but where is it, right? So, I'll wait for it if you find him. <laughs> so, anyone want to take a guess? No? <laughs> okay. Well, he's right there. So there's Waldo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that makes it a lot easier if you pinpoint that. Right? So I think it's easy to make a mess. Okay, that's what I mean. It's easy to make a mess. That's that's what I mean with easy to make a mess. And like I said before. Ich bin ein database developer. <laughs> that's my German reference, and that's, that's about it. Okay. So, well, Apex, it's all about the database, right? Um, I think it should be more like this. It should be like a big, fat database with a real thin layer of veneer, which is called Apex. And after a while, if Apex is out of the picture, we move in JET, ADF, or whatever. I think the database should be big, fat, everything should be in the database. Okay. So, and that's why I spend most of my time working. I think it's about 90, 10 division. It might be even more that I spend time in the database. Um, so I always start with a, a lot of time working in this tool, data modeler, to get my data model absolutely perfect, or as good as I can do it, let me put it that way. Okay, I can say it's perfect, but of course it's not, because there are always going to be changes, and, and someone's going to say, hey, you forgot about all this. Um, so I spend a lot of time in my data model. I um, also spend a lot of time on developing SQL, PL SQL code. And everything is in the database. Everything's stored in packages. Um, well, 
there. And this is the way that I usually build up my application. So I have a bunch of tables at the bottom, my apex at the top, and I always get like a division between the two using views and packages. Okay. So at the apex side of things, uh, what I normally do is use page alias, aliases heavily, as well as page groups. Uh, I never access the table directly. Um, I'm going to use one or more views per page. Um, only packages, and that's it. Okay, so the, the alias that I use, um, it's kind of strange, I think at least. Um, in most wizards, you cannot enter your aliases directly, or at least not with... Um, well, no, you can't. If you want to branch out to a different page, you have to put in a page number. You cannot reference it by alias in the wizard. Okay, later on, you can change it in the branches. So this is the way I like to do it. My application alias and a page number, just together. Okay, And I made this more or less division, like, okay, by 0 to 99, 999, it's going to be general purpose pages, like your global page, page 0, um, that kind of stuff you want to reuse. Um, the main application is going to be in that range, reporting in that range, um, and all the maintenance and configuration side of things is going to be in pages 9,000 and up. If this doesn't work for you, change it right. At least that would be my recommendation, right? This works for me. Sometimes we need more reporting or less reporting or whatever. Okay. So I have my page. Um, and you know it's going to be page 1,000. Because that's what it says right there. Um, and I always put, like, because of the aliases, I can get like a relation between the different pages. So you can see that 1,000 has a relation with 1010, right? 10,010, or it might have a relation with 1020. Okay. So you know in which part of the application they reside and, how they, and that they are related. Okay. So this one might have some detail pages as well, and we order them, we number them just the way like that. So 1020 has details 21, 22, 23. Okay, so that makes at least a little more, for me at least, a little more uh, uh, sense, right? Okay. I always like to put the alias on the page himself as well. Okay, if you ever get into contact with your customer, and they're going to ask you like, oh, I run into this bug, I, I see this exception. So I can ask them, I could tell them, like, well, there's a URL, and if you look for the F question mark P, there's a, and then you get all these numbers. Well, that doesn't work, does it? Then they send you back the like, session state. Oh, that's it. No, not that one. Okay. So I'd like to put the alias on the page as well. Okay, so I ask them, at the bottom left, there's a little thingy. What does it say? Oh, it says struct 1000. I know which page they're on. Okay. So how do you do that? You query Apex application pages um, based on your app ID and your page ID, and you put it in a, uh, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Uh, so you make a little computation, use that query, and populate a, uh, an application item. Put that one in your template right there, up, up, and it will always be rendered on your page. So you don't have to worry about that. Just like that. Any questions, comments so far? Anyone's like, oh, that's a load of bull crap? Okay. Don't just keep going. So the, there was a page aliases. The groups, um, I mainly use them to get like my subdivision. Like I showed you all these page, page ranges. And I'd like to group my pages logically together. Um, and I also use it for my menu. So if I add a page, I can say in which page group it is. This one's automatically um, highlighted appropriately. Okay. So how to do that? You go to your utilities. Go into page groups. It's on the far right side. Um, and create your groups over there. Simple as that. So I created one for my charts, reports, my home, and the maintenance part. In order to highlight the correct ones, I create a little function 
page in group, which takes a couple of arguments. And the main part here is the query on Apex application pages as well. So based on your app ID, page ID in your group, um, it will re either return a true or a false. Then you go to your navigation list, um, and for this one it's entered. Uh, the entry is labeled as home, and on the current list entry, you're just going to use that function, and you enter one for each group. Okay. So now when you go through the wizard and you create a page, you get this option, which page group should it be in? You get the correct group, and the menu gets highlighted as well. Easy peasy. Right? Or change pages afterwards, and it gets highlighted as well. Comments, questions? Do you just want to get a cup of coffee? No. Okay. So these two never access pages directly, and only one or more views per page. So this is the structure of my application. And I have this this structure there. I like to create views for each and every page. And I give them the same name, V underscore, and then the same name as the alias of the page. Okay, so struct 1010 has v struct 1010 in it, and that one has 1020, this one has 1021, so you know which one are related. What if you have multiple different blocks on your page? Just number them, right? Underscore two. See the one is implicit. So, and if you have multiple of those, three and so on. Now there's always going to be someone who's going to say, well, what if 1010 and 1021 have the same data in it. Would you reuse the view? I never do. I never do. Just simply to keep everything clear. And if they're really the same, like exactly the same, shouldn't they be on the same page anyway? So, but you can, you might differ. From, I don't like, I like to keep them separated. Now I know that if I'm working on a database and I have this table and I change something to it, so the, the view might become invalid. It doesn't have to be, but at least now I can use my dependencies to see, well, I know I changed the table, so I know which view got invalidated or was um, uh, touched by the change of the table. So I know I have to change the view as well as the page. So I also know that I have to change that one as well. Okay. So it's more like you get all your pages and you know which one to change because of your change of the table. Yeah. Like I said, I spend most of my time in the database, in database development. So now I know, okay, I have to touch these three pages, make changes, and that's it. So I also make a distinction between like my report and my forms. So the reports, uh, the views that I'm going to use there are going to be read-only views. Just to make sure it's a report, it's a read-only, so make it explicit, right? Just say read-only, that's it. Now with DML, it gets a bit more complicated. Okay? So there are two kinds of views. You have your simple views or your complex views. Right? Well, the simple views are easy, and the, the other ones are harder. That's a good distinction, isn't it? So they're easy. That's, they, you can just use the wizards. So instead of pointing to a table, you point to the, to the view, and it's all good. Okay. These complex views are a bit harder because you have to write your own DML processing. Okay. You cannot rely on the default ones. So with a simple view, you access the table, and you go up and down. right? Because it's a simple view, you can do DML directly using the view. So with a complex view, you might have a view which joins a couple of tables or has aggregates in them or whatever. So you join them together for your view, which gets represented in your, rendered in your page. <coughs> and when you go back, um, you call a package, which then does its magic on the tables. Or if you like, you can also break these up into multiple, where you call a package, which calls uh, Table APIs, which call the individual tables. What about 
What about multi-user change detection? Ooh, that sounds scary. Like last update detection? Good question. <laughs> Let me expand a bit on that. Okay. You have to be careful of your last update. And this is something that gets basically slipped by um, or easily forgotten about. Um, I even had one time I gave this talk, and someone said, well, I'll ask the customer if they want this or not. That's what I said. I'm like, uh, no, this, you have to implement this. Okay. So what's this last update all about? Okay. Um, in the early days in forms, if you would do data manipulation, um, you would always have connection to the database, right? You would do, you get a data, you, you query a, a row back to your screen, and you would have locked the row, so no one else could change it, right? Or at least they have to wait until you're done, committed your transaction, and done. Now on these web applications, it's all about uh, optimistic locking instead of pessimistic locking. So say you have your table at the bottom, and there's Scott and Department 10 in there. You might query it up to your page. Right? You get the values over there, make changes, and you write it back. But if you just do this, then you're missing out that you might have multiple people doing the same thing. Right? So you query your data up to your page. The values get over there. The other one might query the same data to the page. Right? So one changes from 10 to 20, the other one changes the name, first one writes data back, data gets updated in the database, the other one writes all the changes back, <laughs> and it flips around. So the name is changed, and the department number is changed to the original one. Okay? So this one, on this side, has lost the update. So it did something, committed the changes, but the other one came in later, and yours, well, you missed the update. Okay, so the way I do it, at least, is not only query the data out of the table, but also generate an uh, MD5 hash. Okay, so based on this data, based on this data, this is my MD5 hash. So I query data up, all the data gets up in the in the in the form. Um, the other one does the same thing, make changes there. That one changes the name up. So you start writing data back. What happens now in the process is this MD5 hash from the client gets checked against the MD5 hash on the database. Okay? They're the same. So that one can go ahead, update it. Okay? So the update takes place. The department number is changed. And because of the change of values, the MD5 hash is also changed because it calculates to a new hash, right? So now when someone else com comes back and wants to do the changes, the MD5 that's in the client gets validated against the database, they're different. So that one basically breaks, a, breaks all our calls of the transactions as well. Someone else changed this data. So please refresh your page. Yeah. You, uh, so the question is, do you use solve for that one as well? Yeah. Yeah, you have to, you have to solve them because you might get a hash collision, even though the chances are very small, but it's better to do that. Yeah. And there was someone else in the back. Um, I'm, I'm still kind of experimenting. Uh, no, it's not, it's not uh, stored in the database. Okay, I'm not going to store it. But I was thinking about... Um, now I use a, a, a function just to query it in my view. I think I will, maybe I could use a um, virtual column to calculate the, the hash for that row. So you don't have to... I'm still playing around with that one. For now I keep it in the view, calling a function which calculates uh, the, the hash. Okay. So, to do like the ME5 hash, it's pretty easy. Um, the, the Apex development team actually does the same thing with the MD5 hash. If you want to see how they do it, or at least how they at least give you a heads up, you go to the SQL workshop, you go to utilities. There's a section there, it's called Method on Tables. 
And of course, it starts up a wizard, so you have to enter a package name, and you say, which table do I want this method on a table for? Um, you say, what operations, insert, update, deletes. Um, and there's a function in that package that they generate, which is called build your table name MD5. And this is the way they do it. They use Apex Util get hash based on all the data in the table. Okay. So the way they process um, it, which is also in the same package, is like if you look at the update procedure, they select from the table with a for update clause while they do this. Then they build that new MD5 hash. Okay. And they check it against the incoming argument. If they're the same, then they continue. If the incoming argument is null, and also continues. And if it's not, they raise, an, they raise an application error. And you might have seen that one. Current version of data in database has changed since the user yada yada yada. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So that's so the question or basically the comment was so they for because they for update they temporarily lock the row. Yeah. So they, they serialize on that part there. Okay. Okay. So it's been kinda quiet, so that's that's nice. I would have thought like people throwing tomatoes or whatever. So far not too bad, all right. So my last bullet over there, there are only calls to packages. Anyone want to argue that one? Because I think that's obvious. No one? Come on, okay. So I think that that's obvious. You should always use packages, right? Okay. So we're all agreed on that one. That's good. So my packages also uh, refer to the same alias there. So I have a package for this page, and I have a package for that page. Um, and that one might have the MD5 and the insert and update, delete, routines in there, okay? So if you create your page and all the, the standard DML processes, uh, they generate it for you, you have to delete those if you, wanna, if you have a complex view, okay? But it might be even nicer instead of having just this, well, it's a table API, right? It might be even make more sense if you would have your a process or a create or a reimburse or a validate, a more functional way of creating your applications, right? Because we're not doing that, oh, you have a table, here's your CRUD screen, go for it, right? So it should be more functional. So your package might have all these procedures in there, specific for that page, okay? Or you could have a, like, also like a, a general utility package, like with a paging group in there, or, I don't know, things you want to use in different, several places for your, for your pages. Okay, and of course, fully instrumented, so you know what's going on. Um, Martin D'Souza, um, this is my favorite logger. Logger is my favorite instrumentation tool. If you are familiar with it, look at it, implement it, um, contribute to the, it's open source, so contribute to it if you want to change something, um, and you can find it there, or opensource.com. So this is what we covered. The aliases, how I use them, the page groups, that you never, ever should reference the tables directly. Um, have your views per page and your, well, package calls. Okay. Any questions, comments? Yeah. So, okay. So the so the question is it about utilities specific or in general? Well, okay, I'll, I'll answer both. Um, I usually tend to stick with one schema, one application. So my utilities are going to be in one, in the in the same schema um, as my application is. Yeah, they're going to be independent. Yeah, yeah. That's the way I do it, at least. Um, they're also a different way of looking at things is where you keep all your actual data, all the... <laughs> I'm 
sorry, um, all the tables in one schema and all your business logic, like all the packages in a different schema. So there are both pro pros and cons for each. So I prefer to keep everything together and like contained. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to make one final confession in that case, all right? So we still have lots of time. So one final confession. It's not as... It's not like, oh, I really love Shakiba. It's different. So I said I really hate Apex, right? I hate Apex because it's too easy. Every idiot can write an application. So, well, I really don't. I really love Apex. I really I do. Okay? Because I don't have to think about my UI. And I'm crappy at it, so I, that's, that really alleviates things. So I love this Apex community. What, what the f everything they're doing, right? And I love it even more if, you're, if your heart's in the right place, which should be in the database. So, so that's, yeah, I really love the database development community as well. So, okay, so I did some confessions, like my, about my first time, and that I really love Shakib. Yeah, I did my little bit of German, and that's all you're going to get. Um, and I told you about my way how I structure my application. So now the last part, share your thoughts, okay? I know there are probably a dozen things that I never even considered in setting up an application. Um, I also know that Apex is really cool, and I, when I see the community get out, reaching out and doing all this really fancy stuff with all these plugins here, there, and everywhere, um, one after the other, every week a new one, I think that's really awesome. Uh, I really take advantage of them, um, but it's it's not close to my heart. Well, I like to make nice and beautiful applications, but my stronghold is in the database, and that's where I uh, most of the time spend my time. So, give me your thoughts. Give me your feedback. Could you <laughs> rephrase, please? Because I'm. Ah, okay. I see what you mean. Okay. Uh, well, performance is always one of those things, right? Um, well, it is. Just like a, like a story from the olden days, um, I got a call into a, a client site one time, and he said, oh, we got this query. It was, it was actually like 10 lines of code. And I said, oh, it, it, the performance is horrible. Make it go faster. So then I asked, well, so what does it do? Right? I said, well, we're not going to tell you. You just make that query go faster. <laughs> so one of the things they always say, uh, I can't remember who said it. I think it was Kerry Millsap who said, you don't, tune the query, you tune the question, right? Um, so I started delving into that query, and it was a query on a view, which was uh, using another view, which was using 10 other views, which was used. I'm serious. At, at one point, I started getting all these views and tables out on, on paper, and I got like four pages of tables. So nowadays, you can just use expand SQL text, and you get the whole thing. Um, so I said, well, this is... So what do you want this query to do? And he said, no, 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 do not query. That's not going to happen, right? Um, so performance is always an issue, or could be an issue. Uh, performance should start at the minute you start building your database, or at least designing your database. That's why I said I spend a lot of time in data modeler, design your database properly. So that's step one. Okay. Um, I use Logger for my instrumentation of my packages. Um, they have a real nice little procedure in there which you can start and stop timers, and they can also be nested timers. So I know where, how much time is spent in which area there. So I use Logger most of the time. Yeah. And I'm really good friends with the DBA, depending on the client. Yeah. So, and that helps a lot too. Yeah. Did that kind of answer your question, or? Mm. Okay, one more story from the olden days, then. Um, 
I was at a, a client site, and um, we had a, a small group of DBAs. I always like to go to the DBA guys and get coffee, or if they're really stubborn, you get them donuts as well. It's almost like police, right? You give them the donuts, and, and then they start noticing you're around, and if you want something done, they might do it for you, right? Make friends with them, right? The, what they talked about yesterday at the, uh, the ape keynote or the monkey keynote. Um, and they're, they're worse. And these guys were really organized in the database. Because most of the time, if you would go into a room, they would watch a movie with the three of them. They would be watching a movie, and you walk in, and they would like, pause the movie and say, okay, so what can we do for you? Oh, I'd like to have privileges on, oh, sure. And they start watching a movie again. And I thought, well, <laughs> I'm over there working, and they're watching a movie. So uh, I thought it was strange. And then it kind of dawned on me. Like, if you have a DBA or a sysadmin or something like that, and he's really frantic, he's busy all the time, he's not doing a real good job, is he? Right? Because if he's panicking all over the place, it's, it's, you know, there might be something going on, right? And they were in total control. They were relaxed, watching a movie. Well, so I thought, well, that's, that's a good way. So, and it was encouraged by management as well. Okay, I see Sabina walking in with a little card, so I'll ooh, better wrap up now. Okay, so please share your thoughts. I'm going to be around for the rest of the day, of course. Um, well, otherwise, send me an email or use my Twitter to, to get in contact with me. All right, so I've finished in 45 minutes. <laughs>